Hello, hello. Uh, I try to speak in English every week, but I'm a little uh, Spanish today. Um, <laughs> quiero dar las gracias a la organización, eh, especialmente a Cristina, eh, y a todas las personas que me permitieron estar acá hoy día. Para mí es, lo comentaba con alguien por ahí, es un sueño cumplido después de trabajar siete años con los estándares, estar aquí y poder contar la historia. Así que también doy las gracias por poder eh, exponer en mi, eh, en mi lengua natal. Creo que es importante también que podamos eh, comunicarnos y en esta semana supe lo importante que es eh, ese lenguaje común del que hemos hablado tanto, ¿cierto? Así que agradezco también la oportunidad de poder estar hoy día hablando en mi propio idioma. Desde que conocí los estándares para la conservación, aprendí que contar la historia es algo importante. Por eso hoy les voy a contar una historia. Eh, siempre creo que es importante también contar una historia con fracasos. Siempre dudo de las historias que están llenas de éxito. Por tanto, les voy a contar una historia. Para mí es una historia súper linda eh, que me permitió ver la luz y que nos permitió a nosotros como Corporación Nacional Forestal hacer un cambio importante en el paradigma de la conservación en Chile. Está sonando mi teléfono, perdón. Olvidé de ponerlo en silencio. Bueno, la historia eh, comienza en el año 2015. Eh, es una historia que la la identifiqué en seis grandes pasos, termina en 2022, pero en realidad es hasta donde estamos hoy en día y cómo finalmente seguimos caminando en, esta, en este largo camino que es el trabajo en conservación. Tuvimos hitos importantes entre el 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 y hoy. Eso es un poco lo, lo que les voy a contar hoy. Quiero contarles, eh, en primer lugar, qué es CONAF. Yo no sé si alguno de ustedes acá ha escuchado al, anteriormente eh, hablar. Conversé con algunas personas, me contaron que habían visitado parques. Otras personas trabajaron en, en la industria forestal ligada a CONAF. Como ustedes pueden ver, también tenemos nuestra mascota. Es bien parecida a la que vimos el día... <risa> el primer día y tenemos una parte importante la mayor parte de los recursos de CONAF están destinados al combate de incendios forestales hay una experiencia eh, de alrededor de 40 años en este ámbito en nuestra institución también es la raíz o, o la semilla digamos el, el trabajo en forestal, especialmente con plantaciones de eucaliptus y de pinos y el fomento forestal. Y también el... Services and protected areas. We have, or we administer 106 different protected areas. And these are distributed within a system. It has national parks, national reserves, and national monuments. It is a complete system, as you can see here, it's red, and it has a national distribution, but it has a significant unbalance from the north towards the south. Most of the protected areas in Chile that we administer are to the far south of Chile, towards Patagonia, but we do have areas protected in the northern area of our country, but there's still a lot more representation we need there. Here we have some representative samples, some images, and the total amount of the system are 14.7 million hectares, and that is 25% of the national territory. We have a staff of slightly over 1,000 people in the protected area, and we have 600 rangers that are distributed in the entire national territory. 
Here there is a small photograph that became famous when we presented our first study case, I think in 2020, where we told part of this story and how it started. Now, the beginning was in 2015. It is when we first got to know what the standards for conser conservation were. And in those moments, they were open standards for conservation. That's what it was called. And the first thing we've said, as everyone has said, it is sort of tradition. And we had to uh, try to perfect the ecosystems. It's too small. What is an object for conservation? It's not just focusing on small things. It's conserving everything. And that's the principle in 2015. In 2016, after getting to know the methodology, we started a process. And then after that, we, after that, we had finished the process, the pilots, and then we started implementing them. And then we discovered new methodologies and we developed new methodologies. And today we're now building other plans. And then I'm going to tell you the rest. Now, the beginning of the change as I said in the beginning, we had a situation that was very specific. And it was about 18 different management plans that had never been truly legalized. They were just awaiting authority signatures. But our authorities wouldn't sign them because there was a diagnosis on these management plans. There's parts of these that were useless. They were very expensive very expensive, and they ended up just placed in a file cabinet on a shelf, and nobody would ever approve them. And so when we did this analysis, we said, why are we going to continue spending money, money on the public of all the Chileans, men and females, a series of instruments that are not truly going to be working? It's better to destine that money and to funnel it into finding a new way of having conservation in Chile. So we got together, we started speaking, we had a diagnosis, carried out a diagnosis, which was very deep. And the methodology that we're using could bring more things to the table and how this new methodology, how these new standards for conservation could be covered fairly well. And we made our work measurable and it would be used by the people in our territory. Towards 2015, we began this process, getting to know adaptive management and getting to know these open standards, and we started testing how we could use them in planning for our areas. And that's how we created a manual. And also, we designed a new way of working where we would, in each one of the regions in Chile, find several regions, we would find one person that could work being a specialist in planning. And we knew how we could work, how they were working previously, but that we were inviting them to work in this network that was going to allow us to improve how we were doing things. So we were doing this work for about a year. And then we had our this document, this product, that was the manual for planning protected areas based on the open standards for conservation. Why did we do this? Well, we had to do this work because the people that were working in conservation and planning the areas previously, they didn't really want to make the change. They didn't really want to take foreign experience that had worked and to start working on it and adapting it to our reality. And so what we did was to take it, draw it into the system in the ways that CONAF had already done things. And then finally we got this product. As you can see, it's in the same stages that we work on for the standards of conservation. After this, or in this process, rather, we did a process of putting these together where we selected four national parks, protected areas, to be able to identify how this methodology was operating in these standards and to be able to adapt it to the reality and to be able to use it. 
And that's how the National Park, Parisucar, and that's also National Park La Campana, National Reserve Los Prestes, and also National Reserve de Canary, which were the four first units in Chile that were working together with the standards for conservation. This was in 2016, 2017. We already had the manual with all of the experiences that we had gathered from this work. Now, what was the big step? The big step was that after having this knowledge and creating these capabilities, we had these standards for conservation. We turned them into a new policy. And all of the work in conservation, they are put together, public policy for conservation. And this made it so that other institutions, and perhaps private ones, for example, the Ministry of the Environment, they also adopted this work, adapted to this work that we had done. And so those that had written this manual, we convinced the authorities, the executive power, and the ministers, we signed a document and it at the end recommend that all of the work in planning should either conservation plan, management plan for protected areas, a monitoring plan, regardless of the plan, it should be adapted to this. Now, why was this important to us? Because we had to speak one language, the same language, and it was important. So my colleague that was working in the desert of Atacama has to know what this object for conservation is, what the goals are, and it has to know the same thing of the people that are working in Patagonia. We all had to speak the same language. So this is a chain of results. And they have to know what I'm talking about when I talk about a vision. So then we continue, we had an important process for training, and then we became sort of these explorers of this new methodology to write it and write it and become coaches. In the end, we did become coaches of even ourselves, and we started work in training, not just on a technical level, but also for rangers, there were people that were working directly within the territory. Now, we did have failures. I do have to recognize that. <laughs> we also had significant resistance to change. Uh, we know that all of us, everyone here, we've all faced this issue. When we talk about doing things in a different way, we find people that are resisting it. And that's where we had to find a way to make people fall in love with this idea, uh, those that were resisting. Today, most of the people that were very adamantly against it have now happily accepted it once they've seen that this plan does work and convinced them that this, in regards to the key ecological attributes, conservation, and the analysis that we had you know, put together were basic for change. And disbelief, that is also something that we encountered. On even the most local level, we're talking about even our own rangers and all the way to the highest offices. And how are we going to apply something new if for so many years we've been doing the same thing? No, 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 no. no. Now, it's useless. We're going to spend more money. <laughs> Disbelief. And at the end, today, they are finally believing. And why are they believing us? It's not that we're going and reciting poetry or something. It's just that we're going and we're saying the truth and we have facts, numbers, because, well, here, we can measure our goals, our results, and we can see if our goals are being complied with or not. So we go with our decision makers or our stakeholders and we say, look, it's this easy. We spend this. We try and get this. We move forward in this. Do you believe me or not? Because here's the proof. There's the numbers. And another thing that happened was the lack of motivation. And there's a kitty cat. And we found a lot of people that were just saying, 
No, uh, it's that. not gonna work no, out. Gonna Come on, I don't want to have to do this. No, we're, why are we gonna continue with this change? If there's no money, just people don't want to learn. And we had to get over all that too. Obviously, going from one unit to another and visualizing the small successes, and we would highlight the small successes in conservation. And then the other units, other rangers, were starting to be motivated because they saw things were working in other places. And they said, well, if it's working there, maybe it'll work here. All the work was done on site, in the terrain. We built. Little by little, we were building together with our colleagues. And here I'm talking about the lack of motivation. Now here, we're on site, here we're doing just a talk. And the rangers were very crestfallen because we found people that were stealing seats. And so they were saying, but Paloma, why are we going to prohibit and to monitor if they're going to continue stealing anyways? What's the use? And that's where I was saying, we don't have to compare ourselves to what might or might not happen tomorrow. We have to do and believe that what we do today is actually going to work. Yesterday, we didn't even know how many people were going to come. Yesterday, we didn't have the presence of police or others in an alliance with us. That is the big paradigm change that we're proposing today. We can't compare ourselves to our past selves nor our present. We have to compare ourselves to what we are now and try and move forward and become better. Now, then we went after this large amount of work that we did. We then went to the implementation phase. And this was another challenge that all of the management plans that we had, they were reaching just the phase in which we were communicating the plan. Yay! And we finished the plan, we're all happy, and now what do we do? Well, I mean, the phases for implementation, these were new knowledge. This is something new. People didn't know how to take a plan and start working on it the following day because it was done and just to identify and to begin monitoring to start developing strategies the actions contained within the plan and then the rangers we started work which was different than what we had uh, had done before before they were cutting like punching tickets and responding to claims or just customer service and then we would finish and now they're doing monitoring actions and they were reconnecting with nature of course they were working in the parks but they weren't really connected to nature there we're doing a monitoring process which is in palm it's a sort of regeneration in palms this is one of the key ecological attributes within this plan and it's for planning and here we see another ranger uh, going to a local unit who was actually stealing seeds before and then we also reconnected with the community which was really important because the communities in chile for many years they were the owners of these parks and they said oh that park belongs to conaf that is a state park and they have to know that it is a protected area that belongs to everybody and that's how we went from this huge sheet here of just data and then going to conceptual ideas and to understand them and then to apply the conceptual model and apply these very large chains of results. I know it's rudimentary, but I mean, it worked. And that's how we started building it and learning. Today, 20, well, that's not today, 2019, we are carrying out conservation work with standards for conservation, and we are planning to monitor the marshlands, and we're also making plans to establish new protected areas.
Now, the Chilean standards are being used horizontally for conservation. I think that this is one of the big steps that we've taken in Chile to be able to have more or better managed conservation. This is a way that we could uh, just be able to communicate, not just within CONAF, but towards the outside and to measure our effort and perhaps look at this sort of insulated vision of protected areas and to sort of reflect it towards the outside, mirror it so others could understand. And today we have 10 national parks with implemented plans that are working for over six years now. Since 2017, they've been working, they've been implemented with this methodology, uh, with this method for conservation. We have 25 more that are in the process to be completed in December 2022. Then, well, again, we have from, we went from these four pilots to all of these. Uh, actually, there's 10 more than that, but I didn't have enough space in the slide. And then, we have diverse areas in the entire national territory with this methodology that's been implemented. And I was saying before, a colleague that works in the north, in the northern area of Chile, they can speak perfectly well with somebody that works at the bottom of the Patagonia and understand everything that each other is saying because they manage the same language now. <laughs> This is what we never see in conservation, right? We went from spending around $100,000 in being able to accumulate for towards a management plan and then to spend $7,000 in 2017. And oh, he sent some. And, and today, we are building in-house facilitation from the inside. We're no longer spending money in hiring experts from the outside. What we're doing is with the same people that were training, that we had to fight this sort of resistance change in the community, we're building our management plans. And with the same people that are here in this photograph, and that's how we have also identified or we've created reports. And this is also something new within our institution that previously we said we were doing conservation surveys, but nothing was really created and the rangers weren't really sure what these documents were for, why we were even monitoring certain things. Today, everything has a use and we're creating annual reports that are published and now in 2023 we're going to have our first session in the application management of certain wildlife so here we have the national park la campana and we also have a complete platform where citizens and all of society can see everything that we're doing. We have platforms, we have uh, photo monitoring, we have remote monitoring through satellites, we have the moist uh, wetland monitoring, uh, we're looking also at the quality of the water. We have also installed acoustic monitoring, we're patrolling from the different smart platforms, and we have some workshops for self-training and also the identification of all of the threats that we face. And so we went from send, spending 100000 in putting together a plan to make the management plans even at home and to spend the money on what we are genuinely concerned about and what really deserves it the most, which is the actual conservation. This is also something that well, it shows our failure, uh, something we should show. The blue line, you can see here, these are the threats. This is the degree of threats. Here we have cows, cattle, dogs, cats. 
All of this is monitored with camera. The blue line is the goal that we proposed when we formulated these plans with the best information available at the moment. The red is what there truly is at the park and that we could identify thanks to installing these cameras that were movement cameras. Now, what have we learned from this? Well, that first of all, our goals are very off and we have to adjust our goals in this process, which is an adaptive process. But today we now have information that we didn't previously have in 2017. Now there are species that had never been seen before in the park because we didn't have this network of cameras that were in salt now. And this is something that we've learned that we're going to keep, which is useful for our projections. Now, this is the story that I wanted to tell you. This is not the kind of work that just one person can do or just one institution. This was done by many people, our park rangers. And here you can see those that have been part of the team since the beginning. And it's been a lot of hard work. But when we look back and we look at the path we've gone through and we look towards the future, we are just happier to continue on this path because we know where we're going now. Being here today is also part of this, to tell you this story uh, from when we started with these standards for conservation, the motivation and the people that were working with us, the demotivation and everything else, and just to say exactly why we're working, what for, and how much we've truly moved forward and to report this to the citizens. Now, we are still lacking in several things. We have very important work that we have to do, for example, in gender equality, and also moving forward with uh, cultural patrimony and also with work that we do with communities. But for now, I think that a pat on the back for us because we've moved forward very significantly. Any question? I can't hear the questions. Yeah, when we started this process, which was, we began in 2015, and we realized that there was a budget that was destined to creating these plans. The most expensive one was 100,000. We made the decision of redistributing these funds and to build this network, this collaborative network of specialists, planning specialists, and to be able to carry out this diagnosis and for the vision of each region bring to the table and finally understand and really bring together how this planning should be done. That was the first redistribution of funds. And now we have less and less of a budget because we're in the process of, well, this is a public institution, but since the standards give us these tools, we've identified strategic partners from outside to be able to implement this as well. Most of the monitoring uh, things that we've seen, these have been obtained by strategic alliances with academia and also by other relevant stakeholders, people that have always really wanted to contribute. But again, those initial resources were destined to be able to work on the network that was going to be working on this financing monitoring and also go out to find the new plan that we currently have for example for environmental protection and 
this system is made with these standards for conservation. Anybody else? Any questions? How did we turn this into public policies? How did we transform this into public policies? It, it was, was not uh, night to the morning. It was, I think that we took between one and two years to be able to turn this into public policy. And it was with an organization that belonged to the Chilean government. And when we started this work, we made a diagnosis. We built the work, uh, the network, with different specialists, about uh, 25 specialists on a national level. And we finally built this pilot plan. And then we went to speak with the authorities and we said, this is how we make plans. These are the results. This is what we can measure. Uh, if we apply these things and then we uh, had a resolution and it was uh, sent to the maximum authority for its approval where we can see that planning of protected areas on the inside of CONAP has to be done with this particular methodology. Now, after that, each one of the regions is now taking on or each park has to do their planning with this methodology and from the outside we start seeing the benefits of using the methodology and we're starting to apply it in other services as well the ngos and different institutions non-governmental institutions that work in chile really supported us very much in being able to turn this into public policies the Valdivian Coast Service, GNC, Wildlife Conservancy, and others. We learned a lot from them. We copied them, really. Um, before, the management plans were very sort of strict on this. And so it would take 10 years. Didn't matter what happened, it would be 10 years. Now, we have, um, well, adaptive management, and if necessary, we can adapt it as many times as we need. But now, in 2023, we are only now going to be evaluating uh, to see if we have to change anything. And this is under our rangers and others, we see the compliance, what's failing, and how to adapt to what we have identified as points that we can improve upon. And then we create a report. In 2023, we're going to look at the reports and make some decisions based on the report to see what it is that we can change to improve. But this is going to be the first time we're going to do this after the implementation in 2016. If we're prepared, of course we're prepared. We're all ready. I think that, I don't know if I can give my opinion on this or not, but I'm going to. I think so. I think we're ready. And um, I think that the way that the standards for conservation have been applied in Chile it has permeated not just public institutions, but also the private initiatives for conversation and uh, conservation. And this can be an example. And this has helped us very much to correct certain aspects that we had to correct within any of our institutions, really. And 
Chile, there are a lot of people that want to... Today, conservation in Chile, it's horizontal, it's a fad, but some people don't actually know what it is. They don't know what they're doing. Doing this in Chile would be very beneficial for our country and the standards for the work, the network. That was my opinion. Anybody else? Thank you so very much for having listened to me. Thank you for allowing me to be able to present in my language. I felt very comfortable. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you, and I hope that we can continue in contact and perhaps work together sometime. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Paloma. Thank you, Paloma, for, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and please help us return the, the devices uh, once we finish the plenary up here in the front. We do not want Shane going to jail because we have been unruly, so let's make sure we return all of the equipment. And I would like to, in addition to thanking um, Paloma, I would like to thank Thais, who was the translator from Bilinguals. <laughs> thank you, Thais. Um, and I guess it's time to wrap this rally up. And I hope we, we did have two major goals for the rally. And one of them has to do with ensuring that everyone who is here feels welcomed, feels valued, and really has the opportunity to contribute and, and be present as we are and be accepted as we are. So how did we do on that on the noise-someter? <laughs> Great. And then we have another overarching goal, which is we want everyone to be, have been able to hone our existing skills. So that means that maybe is a word that not everyone knows, but it means to sharpen or improve skills or knowledge that we already have and to acquire new knowledge or um, you know, new ideas, new approaches, new tools that we think we can actually use in our practice of conservation. So using the noiseometer, how did we do on that? Great. Well, that's wonderful. And we do have um, an end of rally evaluation, so hold your horses on that. I know everyone is very excited to fill out the end of rally <laughs> evaluation. Um, if you cannot use the guidebook app, we do have some good old fashioned paper forms as well. So uh, our knowledge management and evaluation committee colleagues are over here and you can get a paper form. But before we do that, I would like to ask everyone who was on the rally planning team who is here to please step forward and stand here in the front. Don't be bashful, you know who you are. <laughs>
So these colleagues worked for a long time. We started in 2019 and we had all, almost everything ready and then we had to pull the plug in February of 2020 because we had an, a, a not so friendly visitor visiting our planet. And um, so I'm so happy that we can be here and uh, I hope everyone is staying healthy and that we can go home energized and, and, and well and not take home any, anything that we don't need. <laughs> So thank you so much. Uh, this has been really a labor of love as it always is. And I would also like to invite, as I said early on when we started this event, this is really a community event where we all contribute and we all make this a success. So help me by standing up if you contributed to a plenary. Paloma. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Please stand up if you, oh, and you can please continue standing. If you contributed to a session. If you contributed to the market, it can be in a booth, it can be in helping with the, the beautiful song we had. Um, so who contributed to the market? <laughs> if you helped us raise funds, we did have a crowdfunding campaign. If maybe you talked to someone or you twisted your brother or your sister's arm so they would give some money to CCNet. <laughs> or you contributed. So please stand up. If, if you contributed to the field trip. Laramie, already? <laughs> Wonderful. So as you see, I mean, we all, and I know everyone also contributed with your knowledge, your good attitude, your expertise in this session. So we all make this happen. It's not like just a few people. So now I would like to invite our um, colleagues here from the planning team to, I passed around some little pieces of paper. If you could each read. I've been perfect all the time, each one trying to be one of a kind. I wonder if stars wish upon themselves before they die, if they need to teach their young how to shine. I wonder if the shadows long to just for once feel the sun, if they get lost in the shuffle, not knowing where they're from. I wonder if sunrise and sunset respect each other even though they've never met. If volcanoes get stressed, if storms have regrets, if compost believes in life after death. <laughs> I wonder if breath ever thinks of suicide. <laughs> if the wind just wants to sit still sometimes and watch the world pass by. I get to read about rainbows. <laughs> if, <laughs> if smoke was born knowing how to rise, if rainbows get to shy back, get shy backstage, 
not sure if their colors match right. I wonder if lightning sets an alarm clock to know when to crack, if rivers ever stop and think of turning back. If streams meet the wrong sea and their whole lives run off track, I wonder if the snow wants to be black. If the soil thinks she's too dark, if butterflies want to cover up their marks, if rocks are self-conscious of their weight, <laughs> if mountains are insecure of their strength. I wonder if waves get discouraged crawling up the sand, only to be pulled back again to where they began. If land feels stepped upon, if sand feels insignificant, if trees need to question their lovers to know where they stand. If branches waver at crossroads, unsure of which way to grow, if the leaves understand they are replaceable and still dance when the wind blows, I wonder where the moon goes when she is in hiding. I, I want to find her there and watch the ocean spring for spin from a distance, listen to her, steering her sleep. Effort give way to existence. Thank you. I just think it's a lovely poem and uh, I thought it would be a nice way to and our community gathering, and of course, you know, we can continue to hang out here, uh, but the, the event is closing with, with this plenary. So thank you. <laughs>